Spaghetti Junction is the hub of the motorway network. More than 140,000 cars, vans and lorries pass through here every single day. But today the motorway is quiet. All the action is taking place in Birmingham, just a couple of miles away. Fox Tango 79, Yankee Mark, got a vehicle I've just stolen. A police patrol car, equipped with an onboard video camera, is following a van which has just been stolen from outside a probation office north of the city centre. Yankee Mike, I got a stolen vehicle on the car park of the Asda Queslet Road, over. As the cops pull up beside it, the driver of the van accelerates away, leaving the cops staring at the youth in the back, beer can in hand. Train making off. Two occupants, one in the driver, I see one male. The chase is on as the van speeds out of the shopping centre car park and onto the busy streets. In an unmarked car two miles away on the M6, motorway cops PCs Martin Smith and Jay Hussain are tuning in to what's going on. The cops in the city need every available unit, including their colleagues on the motorway. And, fortunately for PC Smith and Hussein, they are in exactly the right place. The stolen van is heading north towards them. For PC Smith, this is what being a motorway cop is all about. The pursuit does get the adrenaline going and it makes for the excitement of the job. It's one of the reasons why you do it, it's one of the reasons why you join. But the main reason is basically to catch the bad guys. Back in the city, the cops are still behind the stolen van. Up ahead, the cops have laid a trap, a bed of nails to take out the tyres called a stinger. Just coming to the island now, just coming to the island, there he is. But at the last minute, the driver sees the trap and heads off road. He's going over the grass. Run across leaving the cops running back to their cars to catch up. We missed the stinger and we dodged it. <laughs> Meanwhile, a mile away, he sees Smith and Hussein are desperately trying to join in the chase. No! But the busy rush hour traffic is causing major problems <laughs> and pedestrians are getting in their way. No, 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 no! The city cops behind the van are also having trouble with the traffic. And so is the driver in the stolen van. As he turns the wrong way onto the roundabout, the van is hit full on by a car. Beacon Road, out of city, over. But the crash has given PC Smith and Hussein time to catch up. There he is. Now there are three police cars on his tail as he heads towards Walsall, north of Birmingham. Come up the red line, he's taken offside, offside. And PC Hussain knows this road well. Um, Litchfield Road, Warsaw. Litchfield Road, over. Litchfield, Litchfield Road, road towards Warsaw. Now they know where he's headed, the cops can put their plan into action. There's a stinger up ahead. Up ahead, a team of cops are waiting with another stinger. But there's a problem. The stinger's too short to reach across the road, and the driver simply swerves to avoid it. Yeah, he's going to have stinger again, over. We're now on Millish Road, Millish Road. The cops are now on the back foot again, but as the van heads towards Warsaw, the driver makes a crucial mistake. It's a dead end. Well, where we are now? Well, it should be a dead end. It is going to be camp. He's headed into a car park. There's only one way in and one way out. As they reach the car park, the motorway cops hold back. Hold the door, hold the door. While the city cops follow the van, which does a U-turn, back towards PC Smith and Hussain. Watch it, Jay. Watch it. You're going to try and us. The van forces the motorway cops aside. But as he heads out, the cops are waiting for him with another stinger. Yes, he's got him. Yeah, yeah, go on, move the stinger. The van tires are finally blown. Now the cops have the edge again. Warsaw, towards Warsaw again. When you did get stung, deep down you're hoping that he'll stop now quite soon. But incredibly, the van is still going. Coming 
Jake, stay there, stay there. Stay back behind it. He's got no control whatsoever over his vehicle. You are thinking, what's it going to take to stop this guy? Smith and Hussain are now the lead car, and this is where their experience comes into play. The plan is to box him in and force him to a halt. Jay, get in front of him. We'll him. Two, back in. But just as they get into position, the driver spots a way out, losing his front tyre as he turns to make his escape. Now the motorway cops are on one side of the road. They're being to stop. Yeah, yeah. The wrong way. While the van, followed by the city cops, drives into oncoming traffic on the other. Yankee Mike, his driver's door is damaged. He'll probably come out the passenger side if he bails. Meanwhile, Smith and Hussein put their foot down to get ahead of the chase and lie in wait for the van. Out the car, look back in the car. We'd hemmed off the island to prevent traffic coming on, but we can't put on a solid block because we need all sorts of authority to do that. So you have to give the vehicle a way out. As the thief heads towards them, it's clear his front wheels have almost given out. I was wondering whether the vehicle was ever going to stop. It was determined. Smith and Hussein are now on foot, and as the van finally gives out, they're the first to the doors. But they've got the fear, and they want to run, and they want to get away, because that's what they have been doing. So if you give them the opportunity, they will take it. They'll open the doors and run. While five city centre cops cuff the driver, PC Smith is in for a shock on the other side of the van. There was nobody more surprised when I grabbed the person out of the passenger seat. I realised it was a, a woman. And it's not very often you get women in stolen vehicles. And while she's led away, the cop's more immediate concern is for the other passenger in the back, the man who was spotted at the start of the pursuit, beer can in hand. When we'd arrested the two from the front, somebody shouted, there's, there's someone in the back, there's someone in the back, and Jay was there trying to force the back doors open. The cops fear he's been thrown about so much he may be unconscious. He could have picked up some serious injuries from being in the back of the van. It's very dangerous. I mean, I bet he was being thrown around like a rag doll. The cops check him over. He's breathing, he's, he's breathing, he's got a pulse, he's got a pulse. He's got a pulse, he's all right. He's he had a good pulse and he was breathing and everything, so we, we kind of had a feeling that he was just playing along. He's, he's all right, mate, he's all right. He's stunned. Once he realised that the game's up, he kind of woke up and says, yeah. Fine. Get up. Get up. Come on. You may as well behave now. Come on, get up. But his inability to get to his feet may be more to do with the beers he's been drinking. It's because it's over now, yeah? You've had your fun. Come on, let's get it sorted. This one here. He was absolutely... He was plastered. He really was plastered. Turn around, turn around. Turn around. Stick your bum in. That's it. The man's had a lucky escape. Get in. Get in. As he comes to, PC Smith is dealing with the woman passenger, who's alleging she's been hit by the cops. Slapping me in the face when I get in the car isn't really good, is it? Is that what they did? No, that's what you did. No, I did not. You did? No, I didn't. You slapped me up no, the I didn't. when I got in the car? The cops often get falsely accused, but this time PC Smith has proof of his innocence. Uh, you will find this is recording in here. See that camera? You were fine. I, you... I hope it is. Yeah, you were fine. You were not slapped anyway. You were placed into this car. Yeah, the, uh, I don't slap know, women. Happy. Look at my clean hands. I haven't touched you. And the proof is on videotape. As she and the others are taken away, the cops have another reason to celebrate. It didn't stop. We stopped it. <laughs> it's about as quick as it gets. We've got three arrests out of it. Good result, considering it was stolen about half an hour ago. Pretty exciting stuff, really. <laughs> it's now time to uh, calm down a bit. On the M6 toll road to the east of the city, PC Hopwood is on his way to a very different incident. We've got at the moment uh, a vehicle up in embankment. We've got no idea of injuries or anything else. A car has crashed on the motorway, and PC Hopwood thinks speed may be to blame. It's a common problem on the M6 toll. Because the toll road does not get that heavy traffic on it like the main M6 does, people do tend to speed, uh, and as a result, they get caught up with the, the wet road uh, conditions. As he nears the accident scene, 
Police, firefighters and the highways agency are already on hand. The car has ended more than 30 feet up the embankment. As I was walking towards the vehicle, um, I was thinking that there would be serious casualties within the vehicle, um, if not fatalities. But, incredibly, both the passenger and the driver are completely unharmed. I couldn't believe how extremely lucky they had been, especially the severity of what had happened. The driver even remembers every detail of the accident. Just coming along uh, in the outside lane and just went over the rumble strip, a bit too much, overcompensated and just spun out and ended up there. Bit of a buzz. Don't recommend it though. Cost a bit of money, doesn't it? It's one of those circumstances, OK, we're stood here, we're smiling, we're laughing, yeah. we, we've seen what's happened. A couple of feet that way. Could have been all wrong. It would have been a whole Probably lot worse. A more feet this way. Could have been over there somewhere. So, uh, lot to you this weekend, then, I think. That's what your colleague said. <laughs> but the rescue services have been left with a tricky problem. It is in uh, an unsafe position. They're normally either still on the carriageway or just off the carriageway, uh, but not, not in that position. While they work out how to move the car safely, the driver is being checked out by PC Hopwood. Keep blowing, blow hard, blow hard, keep going, keep going. I breathalyzed him, that come back as a, a negative result. So there's no indication of excess alcohol, there's no indication of speed, and the worst is we haven't got any witnesses. Um, so it's just written up as, a, as an accident. We won't be investigating any further. PC Hopwood has seen his fair share of accidents, but this one has amazed even him. I'm a great believer in fate, and if the gentleman had been a couple of feet this side, he could have hit the barrier. Mechanics could have turned him upside down into the carriageway. And as you can see, through the debris field of all the trees and everything, if he'd been a couple of feet this side of the barrier, he'd have been down, down the side of the, the, the bridge. Uh, and again, it could have been a whole lot worse. Back near Spaghetti Junction, PC's Andy Collins and Daljit Singh Nijar are on patrol. PC Singh Nijar has been a police officer for six years, but a motorway cop for just a few months. There is a standing joke uh, when you tell people and you're forced that you go into the motorway um, and you're just going to catch speeders, but it's so different. You've got to be there to believe it. We are quite intelligence-led. Once they're on the motorway, they're ours then. Got a silver chance, just gone through uh, junction six in lane three. And... They're receiving intelligence that a van known to be used by a wanted man is heading towards them at Spaghetti Junction. This vehicle had a report on it that the driver, a male, was possibly wanted um, in connection to a, a criminal offence. Uh, so myself and uh, Andy was uh, waiting up for the vehicle and, lo and behold, it came past us. PCs Collins and Singh Nijar are making their way to intercept it. We're just joining alongside it. Yeah, couldn't have been well better time. Because they believe a wanted man is behind the wheel, they're going to stop it quickly before it can head off the motorway. The last thing they want is another dangerous pursuit through the city centre. We'll go for a stop as soon as possible. Uh, it is indicating lane one now. Fortunately, the van is pulling over. It's not the usual behaviour of a man on the run. But the reason why it's stopping soon becomes clear. The driver is a woman. But PC Singh Nijar has spotted another problem. As soon as I went to speak to the driver, I could see that a small child was unstrapped in the passenger side. One of the things that was going through my mind is this child in a minute is going to open this driver's side door and run into the live lane. So uh, I wasn't happy. Where are your kids? Are they all sat in the front, are they? All... No, there's one kid in the front and there's two in the back. Right, is there seats in the back yes. or not? Yes, there is. Oh, is it one of those with the with special seats? Yes. OK. I was just saying, I hope they're not rattling around in the back. As soon as I mentioned the children, her face dropped. 
and uh, I realised that we were going to discover something uh, perhaps uh, when we opened the back of the van up. At the front of the van, PC Singh Nijar has discovered something very disturbing. Basically, there's a, a little baby in the back of there. She's obviously running around as well, and I don't want her to open the door and go into the live carriageway. More than 250 people are killed on the hard shoulder each year. Even though the children in the van are unsecured, the cops know the best course of action is to move them off the motorway as safely as possible. We were very close to our own operating centre, so it was easier for us to travel down the hard shoulder, uh, us travelling behind the van with our lights on uh, to alert members of the public. Once off the motorway, a thorough inspection of the van reveals just how dangerous a situation the mother has put her children in. At that point, uh, I looked back at Andy and asked him to join me, because personally, I've never seen nothing like that before um, in my uh, police career. There's nothing securing that baby. If God forbid there was an accident, uh, there's children running around. I mean, there's a pushchair there as well. He's not even, like, fastened in properly. Even veteran cop PC Collins has not witnessed a scene like this before. I think the lady driver thought the baby was safe because he was stuffed in amongst a load of bin bags. But Mum has her excuses ready. Do you take the straps off, off Millie May? Do you take the straps off? The mother claimed that it was a child's fault. I don't personally believe there was uh, any truth in that. Yeah, but, OK, you're going to strap him in there, but then what's going to hold that? Um, the car seat, the safety belt. Sorry? Safety belt. W which safety belt? There's a safety belt on these and there's a safety belt in the front as well. Yeah, but he's not in the front. I know that because this little one is hyperatic and she kept screaming and crying to get in the front. And this baby was in the back and she was strapped in. This way, this one was in the back of the bathroom. God forbid you had an accident, yeah? The... yeah? I understand, but I thought, you know... The reason why they have to be tied into somewhere else on the yeah. car is if, if the worst happened and the vehicle overturned or something, yeah. if they're strapped in, they're going to stay in one place. Yeah. If they're um, not strapped in, they're going to be like the inside of a washing machine. She can tumble round and round and round, bouncing off of everything, can't they? And all this stuff is also insecure, which is going to fall onto, onto baby. Am I going to get in trouble because of that? Um, well, it's something we've got to speak to you about, but it's not, you're not in the worst trouble in the world, but what we're more concerned about is the safety of your little one. PC Singh Najjar is still angry. I mean, that's just a, an accident way to happen. And as I said, God forbid anything did happen. What's the survival rate those kids are going to have? It's going to be nothing. It's uh, really annoying, that is. And veteran cop PC Collins thinks this isn't the first time she's driven like this. As there's no doubt this has happened in the past. Uh, I imagine that's her normal method of carrying the child in the car. And to encourage her to strap them in safely, she'll be given a ticket. You will be receiving a fixed penalty, uh, which in does entail a £60 fine and three points in your driving licence. On the M6 near Keele, PC Hopwood is back out on the road, being called to another crash. This time, two vehicles are involved. A car and a 30-tonne lorry. I bet we've got a foreign HGV RTC. His instincts are right. Across the UK, foreign HGVs are responsible for around 9,000 accidents each year. These collisions, they will result in either very minor damage or the car could end up underneath the front of the lorry, resulting in serious, if not fatal, uh, injuries. Fortunately, this accident is a minor one. First question is, anyone hurt? No, fine. Brilliant. I was in the middle lane, he's pulled out, he didn't see me. The problem for PC Hopwood now is to get them safely off the hard shoulder. Is the car drivable? I haven't tried, to be honest. I've just, so I've, I've just been a bit of shock. It is a danger zone. We've got moving traffic in the carriageway. A moment's hesitation or uncertainty by one of those drivers could have resulted in another collision occurring. But moving the car may be a problem. Is it stuck in there, is it? Is it stuck in? No, it's just where I pulled it. OK. It looks drivable. Although the car is damaged, it's still drivable. And the kids go in the back of your car in case there's anything wrong with it. Yeah, I'm, 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 well, one will have to sit in the front. No, 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 I'm quite happy. You OK? And while Mum moves the car, 
For the youngsters, it's a chance to ride with the motorway cops. Do you want to sit in the front or the back? Front. You OK? <laughs> right, you're in the back then. OK? We'll get these two in. Yeah. In you jump then. I think they're on the way to see family members. So it was part of the, the day's adventure for them. With the kids safely in the police car, PC Hopwood turns his attention to the lorry driver. Speak English? A little bit. A little bit, OK. What I would like you to do is if you drive into the services for me, please, all right, all right. we'll pull onto the hard standing yeah. and we'll have a chat and find out what happened. The drive to the safety of Keel's service station will only take a couple of minutes. I think your mum's just a bit concerned about uh, you two, isn't she? Yeah. Notice you're hiding up in the trees. <laughs> It's the best thing to do. I hey, we stopped here last time. Yeah. yeah, you didn't have a bump last time, though, did you? No. It was uh, the day out they were having. It was just something to get them sat down and uh, moved off the motorway. Whoa! In the back of a police car, which I'm sure they enjoyed. Back at the Spaghetti Junction, PC Singh Nijar and Collins are back on the road and on the lookout for a specific car they've had a report about. Oscar Tango 97, um, the Black Focus committed lane one A3802. According to the police national computer, the driver of the car holds only a provisional licence. We missed it earlier, but uh, it's come back into city, so we're getting a second chance. The motorway network stretches right into Birmingham city centre but that doesn't give provisional drivers the right to use it. They've had, in effect, no driving experience on any road, or a proper driving experience, and here they are on the motorway uh, amongst cars travelling at 70 mile an hour plus. As the car heads off the motorway and into the city, the cops signal for it to pull over. Put some lights on here. At one point, I did think that, is he going to stop? But he did. From the offset, the uh, gentleman I knew, I think, what was going to happen with him. Uh, he was quite high rate. Oh, lads, can I have a chat with us, mate? Yeah, have, you, have you got your licence with you? No, I haven't got a good Have you been stopped before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know why? I don't know why. I didn't see until I was coming around here. Straight away, he was very, very agitated. Uh, he, he wasn't happy that we'd, we'd stopped him. Clear can on you it. tell me where you pulled me now? The reason so I wasn't speeding. We're told that someone that drives this car yeah. hasn't got a proper licence. Yeah. What sort of licence do you hold? Provisional. Provisional licence, right. So you've just come off the motorway. I've come off the express way. Yeah, which is a motorway. Is it and you came up the M6 anyway. Was on the to get on the expressway. Yeah. From that direction, on the motorway, on the M6. Who, who's in the car with you? That's my friend. Does he drive? No. OK, so you're not able to, you're not able to drive then, are you? Because you're unsupervised. The passenger didn't even have a licence, so uh, both of them didn't have a clue what they were doing, so it was blind leading the blind. Driving without a full licence is taken seriously by the cops, so seriously that the man is going to pay a heavy price. The car's going to be seized, all right. Do you have to point out to you officially that you are committing an offence of driving otherwise in accordance with the you driving licence? You know, got insurance. Go. Well, because you've got no licence to drive it. Fair enough, I haven't got a licence. Fair yeah. enough, and deal with me then, but my car is legal to be on the road. You see, while I'm waiting here, Gaff, someone could be coming to pick up the uh, car, Gaff. That's not, not the way it works. Can... Um, if you're committing an offence, we just take the car as part of the punishment, basically. OK? As PC Collins calls for the tow truck, the driver tries to get his mate to help him out. Hey! I got mate. I'm phoning people now, cos yeah, you can't we'll just take my car uh, like we'll that. back to you in a second with the gentleman's details... Hey! Uh, ..to check... Uh, hey! Excuse me. Hello? Come here. Bring my phones. Nah, cos you can't take my car like that. My car is insured. My car is insured, innit? So, therefore, you can't take my car. You can deal with me. You can even arrest me, do what you want to me. But you can't take my car cos it's insured to be on the road. Nah, man. Mike hey, Alpha from Leo. Oscar Tango, hey. 97, over. Pass the phone, because they're trying to take my car, blood. And it's insured. Yeah, insurance details, please. Crazy. I've dealt with some people that won't shut up, but this chap, uh, I think, uh, tops the list because he did not shut up. The car's got insurance, son. But it's, you're not licensed. Has the car got insurance, son? It, listen, listen. It, no, it, it, it has, it has got insurance. insurance. Yes. Insured, but it's void. But as why soon is it, 
Because you're a provisional right, licence holder. You're driving well, outside well, the well, conditions well, of well, your insurance. Insured. Now the driver's getting desperate, even calling Hello? a passerby to help him out. Car licence. No one got a car licence. Yeah. You have? Yeah. You want to drive my car, then? Yeah. One second, guys. Two minutes of your time. Two minutes, because he, if he drives my car, it's OK, is it? No, no, no. Right? It's not, but that's it, it's too late. You've got to understand, it's too late. He's got a licence. Of course, you, mate, you can't drive it off, so... <laughs> Andy's seen it, he probably dealt with it more often than me, uh, but for me, being new and speaking to someone that doesn't really care, um, it's, it's quite disrespectful and annoying. Why are you talking like that, Gaff? Why can't... Zero tell me the reason why he can't drive my car. You know what it is? Just ask you're just getting really happy at the moment, right? You need no, to calm no, down. No, they're trying no, to lock me up, blood. They're trying to lock me up again, blood. The driver isn't getting locked up. But with the arrival of the tow truck, his car is. We were going to have that car. There was, there was no, no debating. He wanted to debate it, we didn't. Have we been treating you bad? Yeah, man, he took in my car, man. He's <laughs> like killing me, man. He's like killing me, man. With the man and his car on their way, in separate directions, the motorway cops can finally relax. What a man. Andy's always calm. Um, mm. I think that's what you'll find about Andy. Oh, well, I've heard it all before. Taking his car away from him here and now is, is probably the greatest punishment we can give him. Back at Keel Services on the M6, the woman driver involved in the crash with the HGV is recounting the moment the lorry hit her car. I just went spinning in circles down the motorway. I was in the middle lane. I didn't know what had happened until he told me afterwards. He'd not seen me, he'd pulled out and just sent me spinning in circles. While the woman recovers from her shock, PC Hopwood examines the damage to the lorry. Yeah, that's it there. OK. Uh, lorry before me, stop. I put left hand side, looking, but no, no see, you know, go, go right a little mm -hmm. bit. And OK. Car coming, you know. Compared to the woman's car, the damage to the 30-tonner is minor. You know, she banged and... Oh, you understand? oh. But here is nothing, you know. There is no... Because lorries with defects are so dangerous, in cases like these, it's routine to give the HGV a checkover. Can I have a quick look in, in your driver's seat? When we deal with lorry drivers, we do check the condition of the mirrors, we also check the driver's hours, which is quite an important aspect uh, of their the daily driving, to make sure they're not exceeding the hours prescribed by law. Everything seems to be in order. And the driver is even admitting responsibility for the accident. That's my fault, uh, okay. because, you know, I know see her. But, yeah. you know, yeah, I know, uh, this is difficult, you know. It, it, it is, I mean... I'm looking, it, looking, but no see. Okay. Uh, I have checked the mirrors. Mm -hmm. I've sat in the seat. I do know the problems that you are faced with. The ladies said as much to herself. But even though he's at fault, he's not being charged with a criminal offence. The insurance companies will be That's left to is. sort it all out. He had indicated, and he said he had used his mirrors, uh, but unfortunately, it's the blind spot that wasn't checked thoroughly or was missed. The blind spot itself is at the front, and it would be possibly a vehicle's length, two vehicles' length, where they just can't see anything. The woman's car is still roadworthy, and while the family take a breather before continuing on their journey, PC Hopwood is concluding the final paperwork with the lorry driver. OK, then. OK. Do you want to put the coffee or so you go in? No, I, I don't know. Ladies, oh. and go to the coffee. OK, brilliant. Thank you very much. Bye. And the lorry driver is doing the decent thing. I could tell that the lorry driver was concerned uh, by his actions, or the result of his actions had resulted in the collision, and I believe he was generally concerned towards the, the welfare of the, the, the mum and her, her two little children. When I'm aware there's a foreign HGV in front of me, I will give it a double lane width to give it plenty of room in case it does need to manoeuvre suddenly. <laughs> 20 miles south, 
two other motorway cops, PCs Gary Strain and Alan Coleman, are also looking out for the welfare of young passengers on the road. Can I have a look at this uh, rover in front? It almost looked like it got four kids in the back. Some of whom weren't strapped in as they should be. Green Rover 623. So they didn't get past this truck, right? As the driver pulls over, it's clear there may be other driving matters the cops want to have a word with him about. Oh, one bright light. Oh, here is. Just stuff on the anchors, why don't you? Bear in mind that manoeuvre they've just done, and we think the kids don't have seatbelts on. She's worrying. A closer inspection confirms their worries. Have you got that seatbelt on properly? That should be on properly, shouldn't it? When I opened the door, I saw a 16-year-old girl in there, no seatbelt on, but to her right, there was a child, um, a young baby in a, in a baby seat, um, a few months old, really. Um, that wasn't secured in any way whatsoever. That baby shouldn't be strapped in like that. That's not strapped in correctly. If right. you have an accident, that child will just fly out the car. Right? Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. You need to get that child strapped in correctly. These all need to have seatbelts on. You've got too many in the car. I'm sorry. Come, right, yeah. Just come and have a seat in the car. I do get annoyed when I see children not strapped in because they're only small and they will get thrown around in a vehicle when it starts rolling, when it starts sliding, if it hits a solid object, they go in one place and that's forward. The baby in the baby seat yeah. is going to get cut in half, all right? Or, or she's going to have some serious injuries. The baby is sat in a baby seat like that and they've just got the seat belt going across here. Oh you got a safety another uh, Yeah, but the, car, car. Right. You, you haven't got belt. that seat belt fitted correctly on that baby seat. Yeah. The other issue is you've got four people in the back of your car. Is that the only transport you've got? Yeah. I'm not far going to I'm just only going to Birmingham. Because there's only three seat belts in the car, isn't there, in the back? Yes. Right? So one of them people is unsecure in the back of that car. The car's only designed for five people, isn't it? One, two, three in the back. So what are we going to do about that? That's a good, that's is my mistake, I'm sorry, my first time. I know, but you travel around that like quite a lot, I bet, don't you? No, I'm not very cool. So this is the first time you've ever travelled like? I don't think it is, is it? I don't think People have these sayings and they'll say the same thing to us all the time. And one of them is, honestly, officer, I've never done it before. But that's usually a load of rubbish, and it means you've done it loads of times before, but we've just caught you. Because of the danger to the children in the back, the cops have no choice but to get the car off the motorway. We need to take you off at the next services, which is coming up, and that you arrange for somebody else to pick up one of them. You can't travel with four people in the back of the car when you've only got three seat belts, especially children. But getting them off the hard shoulder without causing an accident is the next problem. Build your speed up on the hard shoulder to about 50 miles per hour. Nice long indicator and then merge with the traffic when there's a space to do so. What I'm saying is, don't get in your car and just go zoom straight do out there. Do not pull straight out until OK. Over. The motorway is a really dangerous place. Cars travel a lot faster than you think they're travelling. So I took me time and I went through it a few times with him, but it obviously didn't work because he built a speed up for about five metres and pulled straight in front of a truck. So he's going to do exactly what I told him not to do. My heart was in my mouth then, because I thought the truck was just going to go straight over the car. Oh, look, 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 look at my image just goes then. How the truck managed to get out of the way, I do not know, because he actually began to start jackknifing, and it was only because the driver was probably skilled, he released his brakes and managed to get out of the way of the rover. What did we just say to that tr tractor unit? Yeah, I know. <laughs> But that's what he's just caused. The driver is now in even more trouble. I'll tell you what, we're going to have words with him when he gets to the service area. He's had a major accident through him not doing as he was Because he will not listen to what he's told. And we're going to try and tell him again. 
and to add to his problems, as the driver exits towards the services, he turns into the lorry park. You see, we're going the wrong way. Oh. We're going from bad to worse now. We're going to go into the lorry park. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's astounding me at the moment. Finally, the driver stops amongst the 44 tonners. Now PC Strain can have yet another chat with him. There was lorries behind you that were breaking so sharply that they nearly jackknifed. No, that is the far way I've seen the little bit of backlog. No, listen to me. Your piece of driving nearly caused a very, very major accident. Do you understand that? Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to argue. Yes, but these... Yeah. Look, you keep on saying I'm not going to argue with you. I'm no. telling you what yeah. you've just done wrong. And you've yeah. committed the offence of driving without due care and attention. Yeah. When we tried to explain what you've done is wrong, can you not say that? He, he just... I don't know, he just seemed to blanket you like he didn't want to know. You have an excuse for everything we put to you. It stops here and now. Do I make myself clear? No, I just no. do I make myself clear? Because I've had enough of it. Do I make myself clear? I don't want no more excuses, OK? Yeah. What you've done, you did, all right? Yeah. You've got 15 years driving experience, and from what I've seen today, it doesn't show. It looks more like 15 minutes. OK. Are we clear with well, each other well, or not? Yeah, right, well, I'm not listening yeah, to yeah. your arguing or your excuses anymore. With the lecture over, the man will have to wait for another car to help transport his children safely. Unbelievable. Unbelievable isn't the word. The number of cars on the motorway drops off dramatically as night falls, and many lorry drivers take advantage of the quieter roads to continue their journey. But less traffic doesn't necessarily mean safer roads. Nighttime brings its own problems for the motorway cops. Night shifts, I find that probably more dangerous because on certain parts of the motorway, it's unlit. Um, and with the speeds involved, um, and it does go wrong, unfortunately, it goes horribly wrong. It's 10 p.m. Friday night, and PCs Collins and Singh Nijar are on patrol near Birmingham's Spaghetti Junction. Yeah, being a Friday night, it's, it does tend to keep going all night. Well, night shifts can be generally a little bit more exciting and you're normally on the go as soon as you come to work. You're normally an instance there straight out the door uh, and off, off to it. Tonight's no exception. Already they're receiving reports of a serious incident. It's another crash involving an HGV. With 22 years' experience on the force, PC Collins knows all too well the damage a 44-tonne lorry can cause. Obviously, at that stage, you always have doubts in your mind because a car versus a lorry is never a good thing. Is that lorry involved? As they reach the accident scene, paramedics and the highways agency are already dealing with the casualties. Hi, hi, you're all mice. Yeah, the first show was uh, kind of female and a child. Right. She's got whiplash. Straight away, I could see how badly damaged the vehicle was. So um, I was a bit unsure uh, what was going on. Another car versus lorry. And once again, it's clear the car has taken the brunt of the damage as it tried to join the motorway from the slip road. Fortunately, the family who are inside have already been rescued. Peugeot were uh, a child and a female, I think. They're in the ambulance, are they? Yeah, they've got two ambos. Uh, the baby's in one and the mother's in the other one. Whiplash, the mother's got. Right, are they like, do we know whether they're likely to be going to the hospital or not? Uh, Warsaw Manor. They are going. Yeah. With the family in the car on their way to hospital, the motorway cops have only one witness. The lorry driver. What happened? As I passed the junction, I seen I come from the inside lane over to the other lane yep. of the oh, entrance. Slip, yep. yeah. Slip. Oh, yep. And uh, next thing I know, bang! Yep. Yeah. Uh, when I says to her, I says, what? I was in the middle lane, she says, I said, you yeah. weren't. Yeah. <laughs> the motorway will remain open while the cops complete their investigation. We will all check the tyres of the car. You could have somebody running on, uh, on what we call racing slicks, where there's no tread. 
They're not, not brilliant on the front of that one, but they are, they are legal. The marks on the tyre suggest that the tyre's actually, at some point, run sideways as it's spun. You just have to be methodical, because when you walk away, that information's gone. So if you don't get it at the time, you're never going to get it. With little information to go on, PC Collins uses the debris on the road to piece together what happened. No there problem. was another car that stopped behind, but all she said, she saw the cars when that stopped. I said, well, if you haven't seen anything, no. that's so it's way to So we haven't got anybody independent then, really? No, nothing, no. Is there any indication? No. I mean, oh, right, yes, there is some indication. Is that a shadow? Is that, that's her, isn't it? That's where she's come off of it. There's tyre marks just here. There's another mark coming across just here. It looks like the driver of the car may have come off the slip road too early and crashed into the side of the lorry. When you join a slip road, you are required to join um, where you've got the, um, the hatch markings there, the dotted lines. Not, you shouldn't join over the solid white lines. Just from the, uh, the marks on the road, it tells me she couldn't have joined the motorway correctly. When I uh, saw Andy observing the scene, it was quite impressive uh, from my, my point of view, being new to uh, the motorway uh, and how quick and efficient he was as well. He knew straight away what had happened and he just had to prove it. If PC Collins is correct about the cause of the accident, it would have been an almighty smash for those inside. You don't really want to be in an impact with a child in the car. Their bodies can't take the stresses and strains that, that, that we can take. We need to establish where the uh, baby was located in the car. But it couldn't have been on this seat, could it? So it must have been in here. I, I can only presume. Crikey, must have been squashed in amongst all this. There is a big push chair on the back seat, and I'm assuming that was probably already on the seat. Um, so it's lucky that the impact hasn't gone sideways into, into baby. It's clear that serious injury was only avoided because the passengers were strapped in properly. If the baby seat hadn't been secured within the small car, the collision uh, and the subsequent spinning away of the vehicle, that, that seat would have been spinning, would have been loose in the car uh, and baby would have, been, would have been hitting things in the car. So the consequences could have been quite, quite severe. <laughs> HGVs are involved in nearly a third of all serious and fatal road accidents on British roads. PCs Richard Elliott and Stuart Bullard are almost 50 miles north on the M6. They're receiving reports of a serious accident near Stoke-on-Trent. Yeah, also reports of the day, still just south of 16 on the M6. Fatal. Fatal. That message confirmed fatality. It's a number of feelings, really, because it's desperate because you're thinking, oh, no, somebody's died. But there's an adrenaline rush as well because you're thinking it doesn't get more serious than this. We've got to get there. We've got to protect the scene. We've got to make sure that if there is somebody responsible for this death, that they don't get away. Something into the back of an lorry. What has trumpet? Northwest Motorway Group are putting a total closure on for us on the southbound carriageway. 4-2 to 2-1. Are we going to be hitting tyre debris coming up to 16? A complete carriageway closure is unusual, reserved for major incidents like this one. As they race to the scene at over 140 miles an hour, the motorway cops prepare themselves for what's in front of them. Going through your head is all kinds of things. What are you, what are you going to be confronted with? Thankfully, ambulance and fire appear to have made the scene already, so some relief in as much as we're not going to be first responders in that point of view. It's the loneliest place in the world when you're first on the scene and the longest wait when you're waiting to hear sirens or somebody coming to help you. At the scene, the full extent of the multiple pileup becomes apparent and PC Elliott is updated by fellow motorway cop Kevin Shale who was the first officer on the scene. Oh, jeez. All right, Kev. Yeah, we've got one confirmed fatality at the moment. Is that the van? Which is, no. They're both alive in the van at the moment. There's a course of over beyond in front of that lorry, it's had its roof off, and there's a male deceased in there. Right, OK. The driver of that, I'm told, 
he or she has life-threatening injuries and was apparently taken straight into an ambulance. So I'm just trying to locate that person at the moment. I think the best way to describe it is you're faced with a scene of a carnage, really. And I'm sure for an ordinary member of the public, it would be very upsetting um, and uh, shocking, the scene that we dealt with. A lorry has jackknifed and two cars have ploughed into its trailer. What you initially see is the jackknife lorry and the camper van embedded into the back of it. And the collision damage to that camper van is so severe that you instantly think, if there is a fatality, it's got to be in this vehicle. There were two people in this vehicle. The female was asleep in the back at the time. If she hadn't been, well, she'd be dead. But I don't quite know how the drivers got out. As you progress through the scene, that's when you see the roof off the Corsa. Two people were also travelling in the Corsa. The driver is being treated by the ambulance services, but the front seat passenger has died. It's now a question of... There's nothing we can do for that chat. All the other people are being treated for their injuries. With the lorry driver and the other injured on their way to hospital, PC Elliott's attention turns to investigating what happened. Kevin, we've got any known witnesses who stopped here? Fast. There's, there's a there, and apart from really what's here, there's the driver of this one, which is uh, a, a black gentleman who's, who's round there, and the, the two lorry drivers, they were both just the other side of that wagon. Right. Nobody else has stopped, as far as I'm, as far as I'm yeah. aware. The cops have found a witness. I was uh, positioned uh, a few yards behind the Arctic trailer there. I saw him break emergency. Um, and I could see the, in front of him the smoke and glass and everything flying everywhere. So I realised there was a major impact in the hell. So I missed him. Then I stopped after the camper van. Look on my left and I could see the Corsa with the roof missing, with the driver sitting inside. And the driver came out there and um, he just asked me if he could make a phone call on the mobile. So I gave him his, my mobile. He couldn't dial, he was so shaken up. So I dialed the number for him, left him with the mobile, went to the camper van and the guy was screaming, my wife is in the back, my wife is in the back. I could, we couldn't see her, you know. No, no, it's nothing. Then within three minutes, the ambulance arrived. One of the HGV drivers who stopped to help is also filling in PC Elliot on the events leading up to the crash. No. The trouble was because it was um, so dark, yeah. dark trailer, no lights. I'm assuming because because he's jackknifed, his Susie's have gone and he's lost his lighting, has he? Um, he yeah. said he tried the lights, they just didn't work. And another driver was following just behind the lorry. What it was, um, I hit the roof of a car, so I thought. Yeah. And it was the roof of the bloody car. Right, OK. So that driver has come through the scene just after it's happened, and he's actually struck the roof. The firemen haven't cut that roof off. That's, been, that's come off in the collision. Uh, and he's hit the roof when it was lying in the road. There's one question people always ask you, and that's why. If people can understand why something's happened, they seem better able to, to deal with the consequences of it. I was just having a look to see if the cables from the uh, cab unit are still attached to the trailer, because it's those cables that provide the lighting to the, the back of the trailer. If the back of the trailer's unlit, then that's going to explain why people aren't seeing it to some degree. While the investigations continue into why the lorry jackknifed, PC Elliot must identify the young man who died in the car. I've got to check the body for ID, so uh, I'll glove up and uh, check him. Because our priority is to ID him and tell his loved ones before somebody else does. So with mobile phones, uh, with all communication that goes on these days, we have to make sure that we're the people who tell the family what's happened and that they don't hear it from another source and that they don't hear the wrong information as well. It's not a nice part of the job, but it is something you have to do in order to establish their identity. No wedding ring. You know it's a young lad that's died, 
but you have to push that to the back of your mind. It will become more personal at a later date for you. But at that time, you just get on with it because that's the only way you can deal with it. Nothing at all. PC Shale can shed some light on the young man's identity. Apparently the driver of the course, the driver of this car, who's been asking the ambulance crew how his cousin is. Cousin? So we think. Right. Maybe his cousin. <laughs> but this information will have to be confirmed, and that means searching for anything which can help identify him in the debris. Having a look around at the debris and stuff, but... I mean, these are, these are things that have come from the course, by the look of it. The search will also help the investigation. Even the, most, the smallest of things can be key to determining uh, what happened or what caused a collision, so you have to make sure that all this debris that's scattered everywhere, what needs to be preserved, what can be cleared. PC Elliot has been on the scene for more than three hours, but why the lorry jackknifed in the first place is still a mystery. Why it's happened, I haven't got a clue yet. I really don't. The scene doesn't instantly give you any answers at all as to who's come from where and done what. But one thing has been confirmed, the identity of the deceased. He's the driver's nephew. So the uh, details of the deceased? We've yeah, got... I've heard them. Can you ask them to get the ball rolling for notification? Local force. Local um, force, yeah. FLO, and we're arranging for the local force to go around and make initial contact with the family and unfortunately deliver the death message. The dreaded walk up the path and knock on the door. There'll be 101 questions they want to ask all about what's going on, what's happened, how it's happened. Uh, they're questions that people ask. Of course, the big one being, did they suffer? And I would say in this case, probably not, no. It looks like an instant thing. So, whether that's of... I don't know if that's of ever of any comfort to the next of kin, but I suppose it... I guess it is. As dawn breaks, one carriageway of the M6 remains closed as PCs Elliot and Shale continue their investigations. This has been on its side. And police officers are on their way to Sussex to speak to the family of the young man who died in the Corsa. It's not something you can ever prepare yourself to do. You can go through how you think you're going to deal with it in your mind when you get there, but you never know how the family, the next of kin, are going to react to you either. Quite often it will be a case, knocking somebody's door in the small hours of the morning, then they automatically know why you're doing it quite often. It, it, is, it is everybody's worst nightmare when they see a police officer walking up their garden path. It was Friday evening, quarter past seven, the 17th of April. He came in here, kissed me, said, love you, Mum, see you later. And then next morning, two policemen knocking at the door. And uh, they took me through to the back room and said there was a fatality on the M6 early as this morning. And they said the lad was wearing a thick, heavy metal chain and had a tattoo up the inside of his right arm. And I said, did it say man you? They said, yes. And they said, we're so, so sorry, but there's no other way of telling you this. He died on impact. The morning after the accident, the vehicles have been moved to a recovery yard off the M6, and PC Kevin Shale is continuing his investigation. It's always frustrating if you can't answer a question. And it's probably the biggest question of the inquiry as to why that vehicle jackknifed. Every vehicle involved will be re-examined forensically to throw light on the cause of the crash. I've just spotted the mobile phone that I think I'm looking for. Obviously, one of the things we have to do with phones is make sure that uh, drivers' vehicles weren't using them um, immediately prior to or at the time of the accident. But PC Shell cannot find any new evidence to suggest what caused the crash. I want to be able to tell the family how their loved one 
has come to lose his life. I would like to be able to explain to them so that they can make sense of it as much as possible, if you ever can make sense of such a thing. Aaron was just 19 when he died. We try to do what we can to reduce collisions. We try to enforce speed limits. We try to enforce insurance, licensing, the way vehicles are maintained. But inevitably, we can't control everything. We can't be everywhere. And things are going to happen, and they do happen. And I don't think there's a lot you can do about some things. You can try, and that's all we can keep doing. The investigation into the cause of the accident concluded no one was to blame. The reason why the lorry jackknifed is still unclear. The driver of the Corsa was not using his mobile phone at the time of the accident. The man who was stopped for not securing his children in his car was given a £30 fine and attended a driver improvement course. The man caught driving on the motorway without a full licence was given three points and fined £290. The woman who failed to secure her baby in the back of her van paid her fine but was sent to prison for two months for driving whilst disqualified. And the man who was chased through the streets of Birmingham in the van he had stolen was convicted of aggravated vehicle taking and six other offences of theft and given a total of two years in prison. The female passenger was given a 12-month community order. Thank you.